Welcome to the joint symposium on Korea uh, from the University of Virginia along with the Korean Institute for National Unification. Um, the U.S. and North Korea uh, have been engaged in very important diplomacy, obviously. Um, over the years, this diplomacy has often happened in secret and has been highly technical. Um, and we've now moved to a place where those kinds of conversations are still probably happening, but the negotiations often now take place on Twitter feeds and in a reality TV show. And that is the state of current U.S.-Korean relations, North and South. Um, will all of this heightened tension lead to denuclearization and peace, or will we turn into a downward spiral of confrontation where we have to begin again to think about the unthinkable? Um, will it all continue to just be captivating television? This is what we are going to be discussing later today. Both President Trump and um, uh, Leader Kim have made a point about their own unpredictability. That has led to hardline stances, dramatic ultimatums, and surprising announcements, sometimes reduced to a simple tweet. Thankfully, rhetoric is not the same as real conflict, however. Um, real action is happening. The failed summit in Hanoi um, has led to North, Koreans, North Korea's subsequent decision to rebuild a dismantled rocket launch site. So the prospect of conflict is once again on the horizon, and there's no foreseeable resolution. Today's guests are going to help us interpret the state of affairs in the Korean Peninsula and where things may go. What the options are for moving forward requires an understanding of history, and so the Miller Center is delighted to be a host and partner in today's conference. Um, the history is rich and turbulent. It involves not just North Korea and South Korea, it also obviously involves the United States and China and Japan. The motivations of each leader and whether or not each has achieved any meaningful ground for his respective country is an important part of this conversation and we will explore those. Um, and we will also explore how that impacts any future steps in this conflict, including the likelihood of an eventual resolution in any form. What is critical to understand and will be a uh, subject of discussion is the idea of an actual peace treaty formally ending the Korean War. And if that is the case, would we have two Koreas existing on the peninsula or Alternatively, is it possible and or desirable to seek unification? Unification is an elegant word, but just consider 30 years ago exactly, where German reunification, which had felt unthinkable, was suddenly on the table. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the start of German unification. Three days, decades later, the differences between East and West Germany are still pronounced. They are much less, obviously, than was the case 30 years ago. But any travel in the region will tell you that unification is a process that can take generations. And given what we know about North Korea, the challenges of unification seem even more immense. And so we've got several acclaimed experts today to help lead us through this wonderful, rich, and important set of issues. And I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague here at the Miller Center, John Owen, who also chairs the politics department, to introduce the first set of panelists. John, take it away. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the conference titled, uh, To End the Korean War, Armistice, Sanctions, and the Prospects for Peace and Denuclearization. My name is John Owen. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Korean Institute for National Unification for being the chief sponsor of the conference. I also want to thank the organizing committee, uh, Jae Jung Su, Sang Ki Kim, and especially Seung Hun Lee. And also thank UEA's East Asia Center, the Department of Politics, and of course the Miller Center for, for uh, hosting. 
It often does come as a surprise, at least to Americans, certainly to my students, to hear that the Korean War, which began in 1950, 69 years ago, never actually ended. Uh, legally, it's still going. There was never a peace treaty, uh, treaty uh, only an armistice or a ceasefire. Uh, the United States and North Korea technically, legally, are still at war. Um, South Korea never actually signed the armistice. We're here because right now there's a time, we're in a time of unusual promise, but also unusual peril. Uh, the promise comes from things Bill Antholis just mentioned, recent summits between the two countries' presidents. The peril comes from real uncertainty about what's next and what these summits will amount to, particularly uh, the last one, what's the out outcome. So we're justified in being perplexed about the present and the future of this uh, important relationship and indeed um, the future of the Korean Peninsula. But we're fortunate in having some experts to guide us, the perplexed, uh, through this. Um, first, some opening remarks are going to come to us from um, Byung Kun Jun, Vice President of the Korean Institute for National Unification. Just a word about him. Uh, I'll, he will speak and then I'll introduce our, our panelists. Uh, Dr. Byung is uh, a specialist in Chinese politics, international relations of Northeast Asia, and relations between China and North Korea. He earned both his PhD in political science and a bachelor's in literature from Hankook University. His recent publications include China's sanctions on North Korea after its fourth nuclear test, seeking unification strategy based on the changed uh, for unification after the North Korea's fourth and fifth nuclear tests and ways to spread public consensus on unification, and uh, development of Sino-North Korean relations after the establishment of diplomatic ties between South Korea and China. So let me hand things over to uh, Dr. Byung. Hello everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is my name is Jeon Byung Goon, Vice President of the Korea Institute for National Unification. 오늘 한국 통일 연구원이 미국 버지니아 대학과 공동으로 학술 회의를 개최하게 돼서 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. It is my pleasure to jointly host the symposium in cooperation with the University of Virginia. 근본 회의가 개최되기까지 많은 수고를 해주신 버지니아 대학교의 밀러 센터 그리고 동아시아 센터 정치학과 그리고 버지니아 대 코리아 소사이어티 관계자 여러분께 심심한 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to people who have prepared the symposium, including the Miller Center, East Asia Center, the Department of Politics of the Virginia University, and UAV Korea Society. 통일연구원은 1991년도에 설립이 된 이후 지금까지 약 28년 동안에 걸쳐서 오직 한반도 평화와 민족 통일을 위해 위한 그런 연구와 관련 사업에 매진해 왔습니다. So the Korea Institute for National Unification KINU since its founding in 1991 has devoted to research and the related projects in achieving peace and Unification on the Korean Peninsula for the last 28 years. 오늘 학술 회의도 그 일환으로서 기획되었습니다. So today's academic conference was organized in line with that commitment. 회의의 대 주제는 한국 전쟁의 종전이며 부제는 정전 제재 평화와 비핵화의 전망입니다. So the theme of today's symposium is the end to the Korean War with the sub-themes including the armistice, sanctions, peace and denuclearization prospects. 네, 주제하다시피 한국 전쟁 이후 한반도는 대립과 갈등, 긴장의 역사를 점철하면서 남북한 주민은 물론 주변국에도 저 적지 않은 고통과 갈등을 야기하였습니다. As you may know, after the Korean War, the Korean Peninsula has been marred by conflicts, confrontation, and tensions, uh, causing a considerable amount of suffering to people, not only on the Korean Peninsula, but also in neighboring countries. 
이제 이러한 전쟁과 갈등의 역사를 평화와 번영의 역사로 바꿔야 할 때입니다. So with that history in mind, I think it's the time to go beyond the history of conflicts and war and transform it into a history of peace and prosperity. 다시 말해 한반도 정전 협정 1953년 7월에 정전 협정이 체결이 됐는데 그 체결 이후 약 67년 정도 지속된 정전 체제를 종식하고 어, 한반도의 항구적인 그런 평화 체제를 구축하는 것이 한반도와 동아시아 지역 더 나아가서 세계의 평화와 번영에 어, 기여하는 길이라고 생각합니다. In other words, it is necessary to end the Korean War and the and the uh, end the armistice system that has existed in 67 years after the conclusion of the armistice agreement and establish a lasting permanent peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. And that is the way to contribute to peace and prosperity, not only on the Korean Peninsula, but also in East Asia and beyond. 이러한 점에서 2018년은 한반도 평화와 번영의 길을 여는 한 해로 평가할 수 있습니다. To that end, year 2008 marked the opening of peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula. 작년 남북 정상은 427 판문점 선언과 9월 평양 공동 선언에 합의함으로써 남북 관계를 복원하고 한반도 평화 번영을 공동으로 모색할 수 있는 계기를 마련을 하였습니다. So last year's Panmunjom Declaration in April and Pyongyang Joint Declaration in September signed by uh, leaders of the both Korea uh, laid the foundation for uh, restoring inter-Korean relations and, and promoting peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula. 미국과 북한 정상도 어, 비핵화와 평화체제 그리고 새로운 미국 관계, 북미 관계 등이 포함된 6.12 공동 성명에 합의하는 성과를 거두기도 했습니다. And leaders of the US and the DPRK also signed uh, the joint declaration in June last year uh, dealing with the peace regime, uh, denuclearization and new US uh, North Korea relations. 그러나 올해 2월 미국과 북한은 하노이 정상회담에서 비핵화에 대한 이견을 노정하고 합의에 이르지 못함으로써 한반도 평화 프로세스가 험난한 그런 여정임을 예고하였습니다. However, February this year, North Korea and the U.S. failed to reach an agreement in Hanoi um, because of the differing opinion uh, in approach to to denuclearization. Uh, and it indicates uh, some difficulties, challenges, and turbulence ahead of us in our goal to uh, forge peace process on the Korean Peninsula. 앞으로 한반도 비핵화와 평화 번영을 실현하는데 어, 각계의 그 정교하고 다양한 지혜를 모아야 할 때입니다. So to realize peace and prosperity and denuclearization, a sophisticated efforts and perspective uh, are required from uh, various sectors. 특히 오랜 우방인 한국과 미, 미국, 양국의 협력이 무엇보다 중요한 시점입니다. Especially our long-time ally, U.S. and ROK's cooperation is all the more important than any time ever. 이러한 시점에 개최되는 오늘의 회의를 통해서 양국의 전문가와 또 양국 국민들의 공감대 형성은 물론 실천 가능한 그런 방안들까지 도출될 수 있기를 기대합니다. So I hope that this timely symposium being held at this critical juncture will give us the opportunity to build consensus among the experts and the general public in both countries and explore uh, feasible options in our pursuit of goal. 끝으로 오늘 참석해 주신 전문가와 네이빈 여러분께 깊은 감사의 말씀을 어, 전하며 다시 한번 오늘 회의를 마련하는데 수고해 주신 관계자 여러분께 어, 감사드립니다. On a closing note, I would like to extend my appreciation to all the experts and like and distinguished guests for their presence as well as organizing members who have prepared this conference. 앞으로 한반도 평화 번영과 통일에도 깊은 관심과 지지를 부탁드리겠습니다. And I urge your continued support for peace and national unification for years to come. Thank you. 네, 감사합니다.
Thank you, Dr. Byung. Uh, at this moment, I'm, I'm going to introduce our two keynote speakers. I'm going to invite the two of them to join me at the table here as I uh, tell you who they are. And they're going to speak in order, in the order on the program. Um, first, Philip Zellico is White Burkett Miller Professor in the History Department at our own University of Virginia. Uh, with a doctorate from the Fletcher School of Tufts University, he's taught at Harvard as well as at UVA and is a former director of the Miller Center. His books include Germany Unified and Europe Transformed, A Study in Statecraft with Condoleezza Rice, Essence of Decision, Explaining the Cuban Missile Crisis with Ernest May, who was one of my dissertation advisors. Graham Allison. Oh, with Graham Allison, right, who was not one of my dissertation advisors. <laughs> uh, and finally, America's Moment, uh, Creating Opportunity in the Connected Age. Professor Zellico has also had a distinguished career in public service as a Foreign Service Officer, an NSC staff member under President, President George H.W. Bush, as Executive Director of the 9-11 Commission, and as Counselor of the Department of State under Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. It's very good to have him uh, join us. And I want to also welcome Jae Jung So back to UVA, who was here in the fall. He is Professor at International Christian University in Tokyo. After earning his doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania, he taught at Cornell and Johns Hopkins Universities. He's been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center in uh, Washington. He's author of, among other works, Challenges of Modernization and Governance in South Korea, Origins of North Korea's Juche, Colonialism, War, and Development, and Rethinking Security in East Asia, Identity, Power, and Efficiency. He's given many lectures on security on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia. So please join me in welcoming, first of all, Philip Zellico. I'm glad to have the chance to speak to this conference hosted by the Miller Center of Public Affairs here at the University of Virginia, organized with the help of the Korean Institute of National Unification, and my colleague here at Virginia, Lee Sung Hoon. Um, I've worked on these issues involving North Korea off and on, in and out of government for about 27 years. Um, in multiple administrations. Today, I will make three arguments. First, some who are following the negotiations are understandably confused about the emerging diplomatic approach. I will try to clarify what I believe to be the U.S. approach. I believe the South Korean and North Korean governments do now understand it. Second, I will explain why I believe this basic approach is fundamentally correct. Even if there is wide scope for disagreement and argument about the details. The merits of this basic approach have little to do with whether anyone likes or dislikes the current U.S. President. Third, I will offer a couple of suggestions for the next steps in what I hope will be an emerging peace process. Let's start with the emerging diplomatic strategy. The standard way of thinking about diplomacy with North Korea, especially in the United States, is a step-by-step -step process concentrating on gradual denuclearization with reciprocal rewards for North Korea. It is a diplomatic process dominated by bilateral negotiations between North Korea and the United States. The pattern was set in 1994, and many experts have known nothing else. I was skeptical about this step-by-step -step approach in 1994. I was skeptical about it when I worked on these issues for my government in 2005 and 2006. 
I was skeptical about it when I was involved in Track 2 talks with the North Koreans in 2012. And I am skeptical about it now. I went through the arguments most recently in an article published last year in the journal Foreign Affairs and also in a public talk I gave at the Jeju Conference in South Korea last year. That article and those remarks were noticed and I will not bore all of you by repeating all those arguments here today. To summarize the arguments against the step-by-step -step approach very simply, because they cannot agree on how to solve the problem, each side gives things to the other that are not very important. Both sides are soon disappointed. That is the first big problem. The second big problem is that such a process puts the United States at the center of the talks, when in fact, the two Korean states should be at the center. The common defense of step-by-step step is that by moving slowly, the sides will build trust. My experience is that the step-by-step step efforts have, foreseeably, produced just the opposite result. An alternative way of thinking about diplomacy with North Korea is to build a peace process. A peace process means discussion of all the issues that both Korea's and the international community outside of Korea believe are necessary to peace. All these issues should be on the table. The two Koreas should be at the center for many reasons including its role as a signatory of the current armistice agreement, the United States is also a necessary party to the talks. China might be a valuable participant, but others, including the Chinese, may have a different view. Instead of imagining a linear sequence of narrow piecemeal agreements, one after another, like cars crossing a one-lane bridge. Instead, imagine a multi-lane highway. Of course, a comprehensive agreement can have schedules for implementation. But all the necessary outcomes are clear, as are their relations to each other. Such a peace process implies parallel, simultaneous negotiations on a number of topics or tracks. As a sign of the current confusion, a very good reporter, Martha Raddatz, asked a question on Sunday, March 10th, to John Bolton. She said, quote, Special Representative Began, referring to Steve Began, the current U.S. negotiator, Special Representative Began said in his Stanford speech, simultaneous and in parallel. That sounds, she said, like step by step to me. What do you have to say to that, Ambassador Bolton? Close quote. This was one of those rare occasions when I thought John was asked an unfair question. Well, of course, simultaneous and in parallel are not at all the same thing as step by step. As another sign of the confusion, Moon Chung-in, an advisor to the South Korean president and a friend and acquaintance of mine, who actually recently interviewed me here at the Miller Center for some television that will be on South Korea soon, recent, Mr. Professor Moon recently wrote, also in Foreign Affairs, that Began Stanford speech, quote, emphasized a step-by-step -step approach and the parallel pursuit of denuclearization, a peace regime, and the easing of economic sanctions, close quote. The second half of that sentence, the parallel part, is correct. The step-by-step -step reference is not correct. 
Began did not say that, and I do not believe that he meant to say that. The current U.S. approach is not a step-by-step -step approach. It is a multi-track effort to develop a comprehensive agreement. The South Korean government appears to understand this point. In a March 13th press briefing, a senior foreign ministry official of the government of South Korea referred to multi-track negotiations that could produce, quote, a comprehensive agreement and phased implementation, close quote. That is correct. In his article, Professor Moon seems to refer to a comprehensive agreement as, quote, an all or nothing, dismantle first, reward later model, close quote. That is also not what the U.S. is proposing. Both the dismantlement and the rewards would be laid out and agreed in the same agreement. There could then be phases of implementation for both, with everyone able to see the desired end state. To repeat, so this is clear, a comprehensive peace agreement of the kind the U.S. government is seeking is an agreement that includes agreement on the desired end states for each of the elements the parties think are necessary for peace, at least for some significant period of years. Implementation of such an agreement can then occur on a schedule. A step-by-step -step approach regards an agreement on desired end states as being too hard. So, it settles for a sequence of agreements deferring to later an agreement on the elements of a durable peace. In the past, this sequence has never gotten beyond the first or second step. <coughs> At that point, such approaches have broken down, foreseeably in my view, because none of the sides has committed to deliver what is most important to the others. The political base for progress breaks down on all sides. A comprehensive peace process would obviously have a number of tracks of work. The 2018 summits tended to refer to four tracks, although I think the U.S. government is now edging toward at least five. My article suggested six tracks. Bob Zellick, who was the Deputy Secretary of State when I developed these ideas in the Bush 43 administration and who joined in them, and when President Bush first suggested a peace treaty negotiation to Hu Jintao, then the Chinese leader, in 2006, Zellick recently wrote an essay in the Wall Street Journal making an argument actually quite similar to mine. He suggested five tracks. Whatever works. With all these tracks, then a peace process will need a comprehensive roadmap. And those who read Steve Began's Stanford remarks will notice how often he used just those terms, comprehensive and roadmap. Consider the issues that must be discussed and then organize the discussion. Those issues include normalization of the situation in Korea and surrounding waters, including relations between the two Korean states. Normalization of other diplomatic relations. The North Korean nuclear weapons, biological weapons, chemical weapons, and ballistic missile programs that are the subject of existing United Nations sanctions. The current size or disposition of conventional military forces in Korea and any desired confidence building measures. The desired economic and trade relations, including possible economic assistance. And relevant humanitarian issues. One example of a humanitarian issue 
is my country's interest in retrieving the remains of our long dead soldiers. If this seems like a full agenda, it is. But it is the real agenda for peace. In a comprehensive multi-track negotiation, what happens is that on every track, each side explains its desired outcomes and language to express that. There is a negotiation. Areas of disagreement are set aside or bracketed for further work. Eventually, the various disagreements are settled or not, but all the desired outcomes are explained and are on the table. The parties can decide which settlements they need before they can replace an armistice with a treaty of peace. Now let me turn to my second argument, why I believe this basic approach is fundamentally correct, even if there is wide scope for argument about the details. Just ask, what does each party need for peace? Start with North Korea. It is entirely legitimate for North Korea to talk about why it feels it needs to have nuclear weapons, biological weapons, nerve gas, and ballistic missiles. What does North Korea need in order to get rid of these weapons? Perhaps they want certain political or economic or security understandings. They should be able to propose and talk about their desires in each of those tracks. If the North Koreans want to talk about U.S. forces in Korea, and I am not sure that they do want to talk about that, they should have a track where they can state what they want. The U.S. view has always been that countries that host U.S. forces should be free to choose whether the American soldiers and airmen and sailors should stay or go. South Korea has a real democratic government thanks in part to American efforts. The United States will respect whatever choice South Korea makes. Then consider what South Korea needs for peace. Their people may have legitimate concerns that go beyond nuclear weapons. Their democratic government should be able to represent all those concerns too. Finally, we can consider what the United States needs for peace. The U.S. has also played a part in representing the views of many others in the international community. Like the South Koreans, the United States feels some responsibility for sustaining a world with international law and treaty commitments. It will want to discuss the fate of all the weapons that North Korea acquired in violation of international law and North Korea's own treaty commitments. In doing this, the United States is representing views formally adopted by the entire United Nations Security Council, beginning in the resolutions adopted in 2006. The value of a multi-track peace process is that the reasons for weapons can be discussed, not just the weapons themselves. And, as I said earlier, the Korean people are entitled to pursue the full agenda of peace. One objection to a comprehensive approach is this. The opponents argue that North Korea will never give up its weapons of mass destruction because it needs them for regime survival. The honest version of this argument is that the world should just make peace with North Korea or lift many of the sanctions, and do it knowing and accepting that North Korea will possess nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons and ballistic missiles to deliver them at great distance. I understand this argument. I do not agree with it, but I understand it. My view is that there were good reasons why, with rare agreement, the international community supported every one of the UN Security Council resolutions that were adopted from 2006 to 2017. 
I do not believe those reasons have gone away. If the UN or the United States said that the illegal North Korean programs can now be overlooked, that sanctions will be lifted while those weapons remain, then others will notice this precedent. We can expect that the world will become even more dangerous than it is now. Not only is this view, not only is this the view of the current U.S. administration, it is also likely to be the view of the next one. And I do not think the South Korean people will be safer if the North Korean arsenals are left alone. North Korea now maintains arsenals of fantastically dangerous weapons of several kinds. The future of North Korea can go in several different directions. South Koreans and others in the region have a right to be concerned about the future of these arsenals. Let me mention a more sophisticated version of the accept the South Korean, accept the North Korean program and live with it argument. Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, recently argued, creatively I think, for a complete freeze on the North Korean WMD programs, a freeze that would be accompanied by a full, truthful declaration and reliable international inspections to verify that the freeze was working. In his proposal, this verified freeze would be accompanied by suspending sanctions. His proposal would be more like the Iran nuclear deal, but trying to box in an existing arsenal rather than trying to prevent one. Haas's proposal is not really a step-by-step -step plan. It is ambitious. He suggests a comprehensive agreement in which one of the major outcomes, at least for some years, would be a verified freeze, one that presumably might inhibit North Korean use of these weapons, rather than final and fully verified denuclearization and disarmament of prohibited weapons. As Haas knows, even this fully verified freeze would be very difficult to achieve. South Koreans and Americans and others in the international community can decide if they think that that verified freeze outcome would be satisfactory. Another objection to a comprehensive approach is that it will take time to build and complete a peace process, to lay out all the different positions and discuss them in detail. It took a long time to create these problems. I hope it will not take nearly as long to solve them, but it will take time. This time can be very well spent. The job of articulating positions on each major topic will force each government to think harder about what it wants and how best to record these objectives. The North Korean government is clearly still thinking about its future and may want time to plan and prepare for major change. Both Koreas can also develop their plans for future economic engagement. Yet another objection to a comprehensive peace process is that the North Koreans may be frustrated that they cannot get quick relief from sanctions. They may, therefore, take provocative actions, like resuming missile or nuclear tests. That is a danger. Then again, that sort of North Korean logic is exactly what led to the whole list of sanctions from 2006 to now. Do North Koreans believe their country is now better off as a result? I often read analysis that says the North Korean government values regime survival above all else. Analysts, including those in North Korea, can judge whether more provocative military actions will produce reactions that seem likely to improve the odds of regime survival or lower them. 
The existence and operation of a visible peace process can help reduce tensions. If leaders want to offer friendly gestures that they think will help, so much the better. A number of friendly gestures have already happened, like some inter-Korean projects and confidence-building measures at the demilitarized zone. But these friendly gestures should not break the basic structure of the UN Security Council sanction system. For example, for the Hanoi talks, Professor Moon indicated that South Korea proposed a step-by-step -step approach with one kind of trade. He now proposes a different step-by-step -step approach. He proposes that Pyongyang could offer to dismantle both plutonium and uranium enrichment production processes in exchange for inter-Korean economic exchange and cooperation. His proposal would not address the existing North Korean nuclear, biological, chemical, or missile arsenal. The inter-Korean economic work would probably revive the Kaesong industrial complex. The Kaesong complex has a sad and ugly history of its own. But even beyond that, my main point here is that reviving the Kaesong complex has implications when you work through how the finances would operate and the commerce would operate that would effectively break the back of the UN sanction system. The production facilities proposal actually reminds me very much of the 2007 step-by-step -step agreement. That agreement quickly collapsed. It collapsed partly because the US discovered other clandestine North Korean work on producing highly enriched uranium. It collapsed partly because the Israelis and Americans discovered the North Korean work to build a nuclear reactor in Syria, an enterprise that I personally believe would also have involved Iran. As some of you will remember, that Syrian work was stopped through Israeli military action. Perhaps this is one more reminder of why such step-by-step -step strategies have not ended up building trust. <clears throat> Professor Moon does end his article by saying that, quote, a comprehensive agreement, close quote, one that includes final and fully verified denuclearization and, quote, what Pyongyang wants, close quote, an agreement which can then be implemented in agreed stages quote, is the surest way to achieve a breakthrough toward complete denuclearization and peace in Korea, close quote. He and I agree about the value of seeking such a comprehensive agreement. Such a true peace process will be hard work. My old colleague, Mr. Began, said at Stanford that, quote, I think it's fair to say that we have more work ahead of us than we do behind us. That was an understatement. <laughs> Third and finally, I promise to offer a couple of suggestions for the next steps in what I hope will be an emerging peace process. One, the governments should now set up the process in a more formal way. With suitable fanfare, trumpets, cameras, Announce the opening of a peace process. Explain the list of issues that are being discussed. Create a regular site for the talks and assemble delegations to get to work. Such an announcement can reduce some of the public confusion and also reassure citizens that the common goal is to build peace. Not all of these discussions need to directly involve the United States. Some may eventually need to be more multilateral. Point two, organizations like KAINU, the Korea Institute for National Unification, and others like the Stanford Group can play a very valuable role. On each of the issues, draft proposed outcomes in actionable detail. Debate and discuss the alternatives offer governments and interested citizens 
menus of ideas in concrete ways they can use. They need the help. For example, go back to the list of six sets of issues that I mentioned earlier in my talk that are part of the natural agenda for peace. Ask yourself, is there now a clear understanding in South Korea about the desired end state in each of these six areas, laid out in writing with the supporting analysis, stated in actionable terms, and with well-reasoned notional schedules for implementation? I think analysts will be able to see quite a lot of room for work. The Stanford group, for example, has given an illustration of the kind of work involved in laying out a concrete timetable and required actions just for a denuclearization process. Over the years, I have been involved in many diplomatic negotiations. This kind of complex, multi-track agenda is often what is needed. When I was involved in the work that John was kind enough to mention on a final settlement for Germany during 1990, there were multiple tracks in the 2 plus 4 talks, and there were also several highly complicated parallel negotiations linked to that involving dozens of different countries. That was an exceptional case, but there are many other examples. In peacemaking, complex multi-track negotiations are not unusual. They are unusual for people who work on North Korea. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming to this conference that addresses an important and timely issue where the United States has a critical role to play. And I'm honored to have an opportunity to speak in front of uh, such a distinguished and knowledgeable audience. And it's a tall order to follow uh, such a great speaker as um, uh, Zelico, Dr. Zelico, but um, I'll do my best. Um, I've been working on these issues for uh, 20, 30 some years, and uh, it's a tough nut to crack because um, it involves many parties that have um, different, if not opposite, uh, perspectives. And the failure of the, the recent Hanoi summit is uh, no different. I offer four remarks in my presentation. First, the Hanoi summit ended without producing, producing any agreement because the Trump team and the Kim team shared a common distrust of the other side. Second, the Trump team offers a tit for tat where the North trades its WMD programs for a brighter economic pros prospect because it wants to see if the Kim team is uh, serious about privileging economic development over the WMD programs. But its offer is grounded on a misconception. Third, the team, Kim team, the North Koreans, resorts to grit. It's, I'll come, I may come back to this later. Where it makes initial concessions in the hope that the Trump team is serious about normalizing the USDPRK relationship, but its approach is misguided. And finally, in order to help the two teams break out of the stalemate, South Korea has uh, indispensable roles to play in terms of uh, building a peace regime and increasing the level of transparency on the Korean Peninsula. So why did the summit fail? in Hanoi. I submit that it did because uh, the North Koreans and the Americans shared a common problem. The Americans 
could not settle for a partial dismantlement of the North nuclear programs because they mistrusted the North Koreans. They feared if they relaxed any of the sanctions before the North compl completely dismantles its nuclear programs and, in fact, all its weapons of mass destruction programs, that would, quote, allow the attended benefits to flow in a manner that in some cases might directly subsidize the ongoing development of weapons of mass destruction in non-disclosed or non-committed parts of the weapons program, unquote, as Began revealed after the summit. It's an all or nothing approach, according to the Trump team, contrary to what um, uh, Dr. Jellico uh, argued, because a compromise runs the risk of uh, increasing the North WMD capabilities and thus security uh, threats to the US and the world, according to the Americans who were involved in the negotiations. The Americans could not trust the North that a partial lifting of humanitarian or civilian sanctions would not be diverted to its weapons programs. So if the North does not agree to the all, the only possible deal was nothing. The North Koreans, for their part, could not make a deal in Hanoi because they did not trust the Trump team. Coming to the Hanoi meeting, they had demanded that the sanctions must be lifted because they had not been conducting any nuclear or missile test since the end of 2017, as the relevant UN resolutions called for. Moreover, they took steps toward the denuclearization by closing down the Pungeri nuclear test site and starting to disassemble the missile test facility in Dongchangri. And yet, the Trump administration had added more sanctions since the Singapore summit in 2018, raising questions about how committed the Trump administration was to implementing the Singapore agreement. <coughs> they were furthermore slapped with an additional demand that they not only denuclearize but also close down all WMD programs, including biological and chemical weapons, in return for an unspecified promised land of economic prosperity. So if the Trump team refused to take any concrete measures before they completed the denuclearization and disarmament, they could not trust that it is seriously committed to implementing the Santos Agreement or any future ones. Hence, the Hano Hanoi summit broke down because both the Trump team and the Kim team did not trust the other. <coughs> now, the second point. The Trump team is applying the maximum pressure tactic, sanctions to the North in order to achieve its priority objective, denuclearization and disarmament, because it believes that the sanctions, by withholding the economic benefits, economic resources Kim, Chairman Kim desires, maximizes the cost for keeping the weapons programs and hurt him the most. It in interprets the North Koreans' demand for sanctions lifting, as well as Kim's travel to Hanoi as a vindication of its maximum pressure tactic. While it is correct that the North Korean leadership made a decision to shift its national priority from simultaneously developing nuclear weapons and economy to the economic development. However, its decision needs to be understood within a larger context. One, a common sense suggests that a state prioritizes its survival before anything else. 
North Korea is no different in this regard. Furthermore, the North Korean state has since the end of the Cold War shown a remarkable degree of consistency in seeking to normalize its relationship with none other than the US as an additional measure of national security and survival. In the, in the early 1990s, after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of the current leader, made an offer to open a diplomatic relations with Washington by having Kim Jong-sun uh, meet with American officials and the likes of Henry Kissinger. Who would understand the balance of power dynamics? Kim Jong-il, his son, repeated the same initiative during his rule as he confided to Kim Dae-jung, South Korean president, in the first summit, during their first summit meeting in 2000. Now, Kim Jong-un, the third leader, his agreement to the first clause of the Singapore Joint Statement is just an extension of the existing policy that his predecessors and his father and grandfather had pursued. And the first clause is a normalization of the US DPRK relationship. The first two Kims failed to achieve the goal because they lacked the means. The third Kim is now using the prospect of giving up his nuclear weapons programs as a tool with which to achieve the goal that the North has pursued for almost 30 years. He has at least thus far shown an interest in trading his nuclear weapons programs for corresponding goodwill measures as part of the normalization process. So the Kim team is not so much engaged in the negotiation to trade nuclear weapons for economy as a diplomacy for normalization. It has offered its willingness to give up its nuclear facilities as evidence for its serious seriousness about the normalization. And it demands the Trump, Trump team take quote unquote counter corresponding measures that would substantiate its avowed commitment. And yet the Trump team refuses to take any corresponding measures until the North Koreans complete the denuclearization and disarmament because it mistakenly believes that their sanctions are working as a tool of disarmament. It does not realize the sanctions are also a tool of war and their continuation may indicate a continuation of the war. Hence, where the Trump team views the sanctions as a tool of denuclearization, the North Koreans perceive its refusal to relax the sanctions as its unwillingness to normalize the relationship. The Trump team's misunderstanding is a cause of their misguided tactic. And that is why a multi-track approach, a comprehensive approach, the kind proposed by Dr. Zelico, is resisted by some in both the Trump and the Kim administrations. Bolton, for example, argues that lifting sanctions before the North Dis disarmament would end up subsidizing its WMD programs. So even if they agree to a comprehensive approach, the roadmap would place the disarmament truck before all the others. The North Koreans, too, would have a deep reservation about a comprehensive approach because they lack the confidence that the US will deliver on its promises on the normalization and peace, even if North Koreans make a progress on denuclearization and disarmament. Now, my third point. 
No, the North Koreans seem pinning all their hopes on Trump. They may be the only group on, on Earth who does that, but um, they have a logic of their own. Because the US has been at war with the North for almost 70 years, most of its officials are, from a North Korean perspective, trained or supposed to conduct the war. Many of the Washington pundits also view the North as an enemy or at least a problem. Hence, President Trump looks like an exception with whom the Kim team could work to end the state of war and normalize the relationship. It seized on what it probably viewed as a rare opportunity to realize one of the North's long-term strategic objectives. It is, after all, President Trump who agreed in Singapore to normalize the relationship, build a peace regime, and denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. As they were coming to Hanoi, the North Koreans were keen on seeing him take concrete implementation measures as tangible evidence of his commitment. And the North Koreans had taken the actions, such as the dismantlement of the Pungeri nuclear site and the missile site, that they believed would send a credible signal to Trump that they were serious about working with him to normalize the relationship. They make a distinction between the nuclear weapons they possess and the nuclear facilities that produce the weapons, and they have shown their willingness to trade the Yongbyon facility, the nuclear facilities, for something other than security. Given that one of the agreements made in Singapore was to build mutual confidence, they are likely to see the dismantlement of its nuclear facilities as part of confidence building measures as well as denuclearization. They might have thought that they were following Charles Osgood's suggestion of grit, graduated reciprocation in tension reduction, where one side would make a, a concession first with the expectation that it will be reciprocated by the other party. And this will trigger a positive cycle rather than negative cycle. Their first moves, however, were not, were, the first moves, however, were replied with not a positive reciprocation that they had hoped, but with a series of additional US sanctions, raising questions in their mind about how much they could work with Trump. That they were slept at the Hanoi summit with additional demands to close down all WMD programs, not just nuclear we weapons facilities, not only added to their distrust, but also likely rekindled their fears that the negotiation might be aimed to persuade them to, to, to disarm as part of the ongoing war. While Began justifies the WMD demand as part of the peace regime in the second clause of the Singapore Agreement, and I would add the complete dismantlement of all WMDs and their production capabilities would certainly be part of the end state. Such a demand as a precondition for all the other measures is received even by South Korean observers with a reservation that it's tantamount to demand for surrender that the North will never accept. The North Korean officials came to Hanoi in order to see if Trump himself was serious about delivering the promises he made in Singapore. In terms of the normalization and peace as well as denuclearization, and when they stated after the Hanoi summit that they could not understand the Americans' logic, they were probably indicating their skepticism about Trump <coughs> himself. However, I argue that they must learn a different lesson 
from the experience. They must realize that they cannot normalize their relations with the United States only on the basis of their trust in Trump. It's not just because of his personal characteristics, some of which might be a little defective, <laughs> although I'm sure he has some charming characteristics as well. This is not a country that boasts the unity, of unity between the people and the supreme leader. If the North Koreans are serious about the normalization, they need to understand that they must engage more people than just Trump. They must speak with representatives and senators. They must engage scholars and students. They need to convince the American nation, at least a big chunk of it, that they are serious about the normalization, peace, and denuclearization. And I think this is where Jellicoe's multi-track approach would be helpful and actually needed. The North Koreans need to engage Americans and others on many issues that go beyond nuclear weapons and national security. Americans, excuse me, when they say, when we say it's not enough to convince us that they blasted off their nuclear test site or closed down their rocket facilities, we don't necessarily mean that they need to dismantle all their weapons of mass destruction and their production capabilities. We mean that they need to engage us on economy, environment, health, education, arts, music, etc., so that we may understand them better and normalize our views of them. That will help the ad administration forge ahead with diplomacy. That will help Congress support its diplomacy. That will help the public support it. And of course, the U.S. must reciprocate. It needs to engage the North on multiple fronts with a view to normalizing the relationship. It will take a lot of work, as Dr. Zelko noted. It will take time but there really is no alternative to a comprehensive approach. So now, my final point. So we have a dilemma, as you can see. On the one hand, we need a comprehensive approach that will address many issues of concern concurrently. On the other hand, such a comprehensive approach won't be implemented by the Trump team or the Kim team under the current circumstances. So what do we do now? And I think Dr. Zelikov makes an important point that I believe is a key to solving the dilemma. Quote, and I quote, quote him, the two Koreans should be at the center, unquote. And I think South Korea actually has more central roles to play in helping build confidence between Washington and Pyongyang, which will in turn help a comprehensive agreement adopted and implemented by both. The two Koreas have since 1990 made a number of important agreements that lay out their special relationship on the way to unification although they have yet to implement them to the full, the last two agreements made by President Moon and Chairman Kim at Panmunjom and Pyongyang last year represent, in a way, a culmination of the series of inter-Korean agreements. They agreed to demilitarize the DMZ and take several measures to diminish the likelihood of a conflict. The Moon and Kim governments are on their way to implementing these agreements that are characterized by some analysts as a de facto peace agreement or non-aggression pact between the Koreas. In light of and in 
line with the progress between the Koreas. South Korea can play three indispensable roles here. First, the Moon government should proceed to implement the agreement with Pyongyang in coordination and collaboration with its allies and friends, and with a shared understanding that such an inter-Korean process is an inalienable part of the regional peace building. One, aspect, one important aspect of this agreement is that Kim and Moon agree to quote, remove the danger of war from the entire Korean Peninsula, unquote, and quote, fundamentally transform the enmity, unquote. If these agreed goals are achieved, that would de facto establish a peace regime between the two Koreas. The inter-Korean peace building will facilitate the process of normalizing the North relationship, not only with the US, but also with Japan, and can be part of a larger process to build peace in Northeast Asia, which would help allay Pyongyang's security concerns. And this will, in turn, help the Kim team turn to a comprehensive approach with a reduced obsession with its security concerns. The second important aspect of the inter-Korean agreement is to increase exchanges and cooperation between the two Koreas on a multiple, multiplicity of issues, including humanitarian, environmental, public health, and e economic ones. As this aspect of the agreement is realized, it will open up more channels of communication and raise the level of transparency which will in turn allay Pyongyang, Washington's suspicions and South Korean concerns about the Kim team's intentions. As the increase in communication and transparency allays, allays Washington's concerns, it will help the Trump team relax its precondition of the North's dismantlement and turn to the multi-track approach that includes disarmament as one of the end states not a precondition. Given that the Hanoi summit failed to, due to the lack of mutual trust, as I argued in the first section, public diplomacy between the two countries, and indeed between the two nations, would go a long way toward building trust, which, may, which will ultimately facilitate the denuclearization and the peace process. So the Moon government can perhaps persuade the Trump team and the Kim team to consider going further than the existing agreements. Why not, for example, send Lady Gaga? <laughs> and I watched the movie on Lady Gaga on, on the flight. <laughs> and Kendrick Lamar to North Korea for a national tour. Why not ask BTS and Blackpink to do the same? In turn, why not invite North Korean idol girl group, Morambong or Samjian group, or North National Orchestra for a national tour? Women's soccer matches would also, could also be considered. All in all, a further development of the inter-Korean relationship combined with the public diplomacy would help the North and the US understand better and develop mutual trust. And as they do, they would be more inclined to adopt and implement a comprehensive agreement that is a difficult but only real solution to the multiplicity of issues between the countries and the region. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sa, for that, and Professor Zalico. We have a few minutes, I'm at least 12, maybe a little more. Um, so in a moment, we can open it up for your questions. I, I thought I would take the, um, uh, well, whatever prerogative I've assumed by being up here by asking the first. Um, 
It's remarkable, as I understood the two of you, you do agree on the desirability of what Philip Zelliker calls a comprehensive approach. So neither of you is advocating the piecemeal step-by-step -step approach. Um, but if I heard you correctly, you disagree on whether you, the United States, the Trump administration, is in fact pursuing a comprehensive approach. I heard uh, fairly pronounced disagreement. So I wonder if I could get the two of you to discuss that. This is a, a narrow but important disagreement about what the Trump administration is actually up to, how it's proceeding. So. Um, I'm glad to start. Um, I'll just say I believe my representation of the American position is accurate. Um, I can't go into why I believe it is accurate, but I believe it is accurate. The uh, constant references to, well, they insist on dismantlement of all the nuclear weapons as a, quote, precondition. It's not a precondition that comes before a comprehensive agreement. They're saying it is a necessary part of a comprehensive agreement. So they won't, in other words, it's, it's the precondition to the full trade, all the trades. But it's just basically one more thing that has to be in the comprehensive agreement. They also have, uh, um, so there is a legitimate question. So uh, for instance, this is, well, uh, North Korea is interested in trading economic development for nuclear weapons. They've made that clear. Fine, spell out the whole trade. Write out the whole trade. Here's what we're prepared to give up. Let's negotiate. Here's what we're prepared to give up, and here's what we expect to get. And let's write the whole thing out, but nothing will happen until everything is agreed. But then once everything is agreed, go forward. There is then the issue of, yes, but maybe once it's all agreed, the Americans will insist on stages in the implementation of the agreement that will front load the denuclearization before they give any economic relief. That's, understand, that's not the issue now. The issue is, oh, we have an agreement on what to do, and we're arguing about the staging of the, impl of the implementation. And of course, then you just negotiate that. And if it turns out that the Americans take in it, that we've agreed on all the contents of the comprehensive agreement, but the Americans are, front are, are, uh, are taking an untenable position on the staging of the implementation, OK, then let's have that argument, and maybe the Americans will be wrong. And I'll criticize them. But, the desire to spell out the entire trade, all the trades, and all the desires in the comprehensive agreement before implementation is key. So you see what happened here in Hanoi is they're saying, well, we'll close Yongbyon, and we'll, uh, or, and we'll close, uh, or we'll let you supervise Yongbyon, and we'll close our missile test sites, but we're not going to do anything about the arsenal. Can we now have some, can we please now have something, some concrete measures from you? All of you do understand that's a step-by-step -step agreement. That's the step-by-step -step logic. So it, from the American point of view, in a little bit, it's like, OK, that's the third time you've tried to sell us Young Beyond. When you tried to sell us Young Beyond in 1994, it was really valuable. When you tried to sell us Young Beyond in 2007, it was no longer so valuable, we discovered. When you're trying to sell it to us now, it's not very valuable at all, because the do we really care whether North Korea has 40 nuclear weapons or 45 nuclear weapons or 46? The issue, we're now, we're now at a stage where the issue is the arsenals, not the production facilities anymore. So the, and I actually think that they basically got all the arsenal they want. There is some issue as to whether or not they'd like to perfect their ICBMs. And I think the United States has a view on that. But um, they pretty much are kind of where they need to be. The, they get diminishing returns now on investment in the production facilities. The issues are the arsenal. So the Americans are saying, we're not going to lift sanctions until we address the arsenal. So that, but it, it seems to me it's perfectly appropriate for the North Koreans to say, well, we're not going to get rid of the arsenal until we know what we're going to get. Fair enough. Then let's spell it all out. And uh, now I'm taking a position on the conceptual approach. Of the, of the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Could the U.S. government then apply this approach in a way that's designed to defeat agreement and be unreasonable? And Of course. And then we can have an argument about that. My defense is that this is the right basic conceptual approach because you need to get a comprehensive agreement and you need to put all the issues on the table. And some of these issues concern the Americans, but many of them do not. And many of them are primarily between the Koreas. 
Thank you. JJ Saab, you have a response. Well, uh, let me first say that um, I'm not privy to internal deliberations of the, the American administration or North Korean uh, or South Korean, uh, for that matter. Um, although um, I'm a U.S. citizen and I used to uh, teach at SICE and uh, had uh, some access to uh, the U.S. government deliberations. But now I'm, I'm, I'm in Japan. So my analysis is uh, based on what's available in the public. And uh, uh, I'll first say that um, I agree with uh, Dr. Zelico that uh, doc, uh, Professor Moon and uh, uh, the reporter you mentioned and many others misunderstood Began's uh, address. Um, Began never talked about step-by-step -step approach. He did talk about um, simultaneous and in parallel uh, progress on, on the issue, many issues, but he never uh, talked about a step-by-step -step approach. But somehow, many people misunderstood, misunderstood him. So um, he uh, did advocate an approach that would address many, many issues of um, uh, mutual concern uh, from the beginning. And in that sense, he is um, uh, proposing a comprehensive approach. And uh, I don't know exactly what kind of uh, agreement uh, that uh, the Trump administration is envisioning, but I'm, I guess, uh, coming at it from a more analytical perspective that looks at the logic of official thinking. And uh, I'll read the quote again. This is um, uh, what Began said in New York after the Hanoi summit. And uh, he said that um, uh, lifting sanctions would, quote, allow, allow the, the attended benefits to flow in a manner that in some cases might directly subsidize the ongoing development of weapons of mass destruction in non-disclosed or non-committed parts of the weapons program. I mean, if this is the logic that operates behind American policies, then lifting sanctions can come, may come, only after the denuclearization and disarmament for that matter. And so even if um, you know, they are proposing a comprehensive agreement and uh, the end state may list a number of uh, issues, their approach seems to be step-by-step -step implementation, denuclearization and disarmament before all the other tracks can be pursued. So again, I'm not exactly sure what kind of, um, and, uh, what kind of a roadmap uh, the, the uh, Trump administration is uh, envisioning, but the logic suggests that um, uh, the implementation will be a step-by-step -step implementation. And, well, let me stop here. Okay, good. Thank you. That, now, that's very illuminating, the exchange. Thank you for that. Uh, we can take one or two questions. I saw Brantley, Professor Womack. Well, this has really been a, a wonderful discussion of the complexities of a very important issue. And I think besides the, the agreement between uh, Professor Sewell and, and and Philip, uh, there's also an agree uh, on comprehensiveness. There's an agreement on the role, uh, the special role of relationships between the Koreas. As uh, uh, Philip said in his remarks, and as Professor Su quoted his remarks, uh, that's important. And if you think about it, who knows North Korea better than the South Koreans? Uh, who has experienced the problems of war and the problems of uncertainty in the post-war period better than the South Koreans? Uh, but 
that leaves me with the question. Uh, it's, it sounds to me like uh, uh, what Philip is proposing uh, is still an agenda set by the United States. He, he's not proposing a, a Obama-style leading from behind, which considering that that was first used in the Libya uh, situation is not a wonderful uh, reference. Uh, he's, but he's sort of leading from above. And I wonder how you would operationalize, Philip, that central role of uh, north-south uh, interaction for solving the peace problem. How do we uh, acknowledge, accommodate our partner who is more at risk and more knowledgeable about the situation? Um, quickly. Uh they are no, they're more knowledgeable about many things. There are a number of especially military issues about which we are, we are more knowledgeable than they are, as they know. Um, we have both a lot of technical knowledge and intelligence collection abilities that they do not have. But I take the general point. So imagine you had uh, six tracks. The United States actually might only be a participant, a central participant, in, say, three of them. South Korea would be in all six. So you're, uh, you can imagine then a complex of negotiations where uh, quite a lot of the negotiations, actually the United States not even at the table, but the South Koreans are always at the table in all of them. That you begin then to get a feel of the optics of a peace process negotiation in which the South Koreans themselves will be taking more ownership and in which they'll also be looking at the overall conditions that make them feel peaceful and reassured uh, making arguments about, for instance, the staging of implementation, which are very familiar arguments to people who've worked in, you know, if you worked on Arab-Israeli talks, you know, the state, the choreography of who withdraws from what, when, and the, the, there's a lot of those sorts of problems that will come up. By the way, if I believe such a, the kind of peace process I've described probably will not even get finalized while this president is in this term of office because of the scale of work involved. So you begin to think about a momentum in which increasingly the South Koreans will be recognized as a central player with the United States playing a supporting role that's crucial on certain issues. And then there will be all sorts of questions about Chinese, Japanese, relation to the UN Security Council, and, and so on. Uh, the United States is in an unusual position to sort of represent the broader UN sanctions regime and those concerns. But those only affect some of the issues the two Koreas can settle, including fundamentally, what do we want the future condition of the peninsula to be? What is the future status of our two countries and their relation to each other, which is an absolutely core issue of principle in both those places and is fundamentally an issue for them to decide. And. Uh the two Koreas in recent years have uh, played a uh, leading role in many ways in uh, producing agreements and uh, working toward uh, creating peace regime. And uh, even the summit, the US and DPRK summit meeting in Singapore last year was um, uh, facilitated by uh, the South Koreans. So uh, no, um, Moon, President Moon had a summit meeting with uh, Kim first, and a uh, summit with um, uh, the President Trump came up uh, in the discussions, and uh, that was um, a relayed uh, to the White House, which then uh, led to uh, the meeting. And of course, uh, before the meeting was uh, actually held, um, Trump threw temper tantrum, and he said he was not going to the meeting, and so. Uh, President Moon and uh, Kim had a ad hoc meeting at Panmunjom uh, to get this process going and somehow convinced um, uh, Trump to come to Singapore. And so, uh, although, you know, Koreans uh, were not as uh, forthcoming and uh, leading uh, in these uh, processes, uh, they really uh, came of um, age and uh, they are playing uh, visible and central roles on the peninsula. Having said that, I would also uh, hasten to add that uh, the U.S. still 
has uh, some critical roles to play. For example, when President Moon uh, went to uh, Pyongyang uh, for a summit meeting, when a Korean officials or civilians, South Korean civilians, uh, cross the border, DMZ, uh, to the north, they have to get an uh, approval from the United Nations command, which is uh, commanded by an American general. So, you know, it's all part of uh, the armistice uh, agreement, but um, uh, the U.S. government, particularly the U.S. military, still has uh, very important roles of uh, maintaining uh, the armistice and uh, maintaining uh, the peace on, on the peninsula. And uh, uh, even if uh, South Korea and North Korea make uh, progress on building a peace regime, the peace would not be complete unless there is peace between the U.S. and North Korea. Have we time for one more? I saw this gentleman in the middle, and I think that will, that will be the last. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm Wook Sik uh, from South Korea. Uh, I want to give some uh, short comment to, uh, to uh, Dr. Jailiko's uh, presentation. I also think that we need to uh, discuss about the comprehensive approach. I totally agree about that. However, uh, including other uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, biological weapons, chemical weapons, and uh, ballistic missiles into the concept of denuclearization is too comprehensive to achieve the desirable goal. It's too big to catch because uh, this kind of uh, approach, as you know well, the, uh, to dismantle and verify the uh, chemical and bio biological weapons much uh, difficult and challenging job rather than nuclear weapons. So uh, the United States need to uh, 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 choose and uh, concentrate the strategically uh, defined denuclearization, that's the nuclear weapons, nuclear materials, and uh, related facilities. And the other weapons of mass destruction should be the negotiation uh, to, uh, to, to, to Korea's. Uh, because two Koreas already the, uh, phased uh, arms reduction uh, in last year's summit meeting. So uh, the, the, uh, in order to realize the com so-called comprehensive approach, the uh, United States should uh, choose and uh, com uh, concentrate on the strictly defined denuclearization. Thank you. Uh, I just can answer briefly. Um, you got to follow the language of the UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, at least you have to pay attention to that. South Korea cannot unilaterally tear up those resolutions and will not want to. South Korea agreed to all those resolutions at the time they were adopted. And so people may decide that some of the weapons discussed in those resolutions no longer need to be addressed. But that's a negotiation. And, and you make that, you can make the arguments as to that verification is too hard, let, or uh, North Korea has already signed the Biological Weapons Toxin Convention. It's not supposed to have a biological weapons arsenal. Um, maybe there are some things that can be done to reaffirm that North Korea is in compliance with the treaty that it signed in the 1970s. Um, but that, again, that, but that's something you have to negotiate your way through. You can't just put it aside because it's there in the UN resolutions and South Korea supports those resolutions. And I think uh, one of his points was that um, uh, the, one of the inter-Korean agreements la made last year includes a clause about disarmament. And uh, it's not that um, uh, South Korea is interested in living uh, with uh, North Korea that's armed with uh, biological or chemical weapons, but um, South Korea already has an agreement with the North on a disarmament of uh, these uh, weapons. And, and so um, these uh, issues can be addressed uh, um, in, in uh, inter-Korean uh, uh, negotiations as part of um, uh, the Korean peace uh, process. And uh, um, disarmament of uh, all WMDs can and perhaps it should be part of the end state. 
Um, but um, if uh, it's uh, held up as a precondition for anything else, then it could uh, even uh, create problems for denuclearization. And with that, let me, let me uh, before we thank our panelists, let me say, J.J. opened his remarks by saying this is a tough nut to crack. It is indeed one of the toughest in the world right now. Nonetheless, uh, I found it fascinating and encouraging that these two panelists agree on so much on the idea of a compre comprehensive repro uh, up approach, without reproach perhaps, um, <laughs> South Korea's centrality, what, how and whether this can be implemented to all sides um, approval is, remains to be seen. But uh, we, have, I, we draw from this some encouragement. So thank you very much, both of you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay.